Hello, so I'll start the panel since we are talking about uh, children's picture books and early readers. My first question is, how are children uh, introduced to stories and how has that evolved over the years? Because you, all three of you have been so closely involved in the making and publishing of you know, books for children. So, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, and it's a pleasure to interact with the audience like this. Uh, so, introduction to, to stories, uh, I think uh, if I give you an Indian context to it, and I also will share local context because at Scholastic we do a lot of research and we always found that Read Without is probably the first pillar towards child becoming the reader. And, and when I look at it from an Indian context, and there was a question put to me once, uh, where somebody asked me, you know, why are you are harping so much to read it out? India was never a read it out society. Now, the difference between the Indian society then and Indian society now is that there was a strong culture of storytelling from the mouths of the grandparents who knew stories and who had time, and, and it was a joint family structure in India. Right? From a joint family structure, we moved on to a nuclear family structure. From a nuclear family structure, we moved to both parents working. And that's where, you know, similar to the global audience, so we also required read aloud because parents unfortunately didn't know stories. So the only thing that they could do was use a visual aid and, and, and a book aid to engage with the children in the story. And to me, that's the first step towards building a reading habit. Unfortunately, we feel that read aloud is only appropriate till the time the child starts to read. Whereas again, research points out, children enjoy read alouds even when they start reading on their own. Also because that's a special time to bond with their parents. So we as parents feel that my child can read now, so I can hand over a book to them and now I don't need to read aloud. I would say read aloud is a very important component and it should continue even when the child starts reading. And that's what research points out. Well, first I must say, zam, wham, wow, something only a comic book publisher gets to say. So a big zam, wham, wow to Jaipur for having me here. It's my second time here in Jaipur. So my father-in-law, Louis Silverplay, and his partner, John Goldwater Sr., they were in the publishing business, and they saw a need to find a... Um, new property that would be a comic book that would lure young girls into reading comics. There was nothing out there. There were comic books about you know, explosions and dueling and just gruesome stuff. Nothing they felt would attract that beginner um, female girl picking up a comic book. So they came up with the idea of having something that dealt with maybe love stories and fashion and dating. They thought that would be um, a big attraction and they came out with Archie. But what they didn't know is that Archie would become popular among everyone. So that was the initial um, reason why Archie Comics came into being. They felt there was nothing out there for the young female reader in comic book format. I, I agree with Neeraj what Neeraj said about read alouds. And being a early learning mass market children book publisher, what we have realized, especially when uh, when we started when around six and a half years ago, my, my son was two and a half and we had the journey together. What we realized that if you want to turn somebody new into a reader, first of all, give them books. Give them any sort of books. The books should be around the child. So you have to ensure that you're buying appropriate books and keep it there. Don't push the child. Don't ask them to read. What are the chances you get? You sit, up, sit around, talk about the book, and slowly and steadily you'll see that the child will warm to the notion, okay, this is something, something which can help. Being an early learning mass market publisher, I've realized that a lot of books have a lot of tactile things like touch and feel and 
the fingers nail, all these things basically attract the child to pick up this object called a book. And once you have provided this gateway drug to a child, believe me, they'll get hooked onto it. So you have to make sure that you have that early dosage of uh, this dopamine going to the mind. I have a personal story that could relate to that. Could I share it? Um, believe it or not, when I grew up as a young child, I had never read a comic book. I had never read Archie Comics. When I came into Archie Comics at age 54, I had to start reading those books. My background was an art teacher in Paramus, New Jersey, and I had married into the Archie Comic Kingdom. Those books were all around us, but I never picked them up because I had no love of reading. But now coming into Archie, being their co-CEO, I had to start reading them. And as I read them, I would pile up ones that made me laugh, pile up ones with impactful messaging, ones with beautiful covers, and one day, I just felt I wanted more pages to turn. I started going to bookstores and buying books, going to the libraries, taking out books. I fell in love with reading at age 54 because of that comic book. And I started thinking back, where was I when I was that young child? And I asked my mother, you know, why didn't you give me comic books? I love reading Archie. She goes, because you didn't like reading. And I remember, Archie Combs is usually finds the eight-year-old. And where was I? I was going into grade two. I was stepping up. I remember what I was wearing. I was looking smart that day. And we get to my school, and I see the bound banner for grade two. I'm ready to bound out of my mother's hands to go over there. And she tugs me. And she says, no, you're not going over there. You're going there because you are repeating another year of grade one. You have been retained. You have been left back because you cannot read. So there I had to go into another, grade, uh, another year to repeat one, grade one, and they gave me these books, remedial books that just were horrid, and I would twist them, fold them, and shove them into my handbag to hide my shame. <coughs> No one was able to engage me into reading, and finally I learned, but no one engaged me into the love of reading until age 54, and it was the format of a comic book. Wow. Comic books are powerful. So as you were saying, you have to have you know, the feeling book, something that will ignite that love to reading. So go ahead and take two minutes. So you mentioned the, you know, the tactile uh, elements of a picture book, but many years ago, picture books, children's picture books were just, you know, like black and white illustration, they have two blocks of text. So how much difference has these interactive picture, you know, children's pictures book made to the, you know, uh, the, the market made, and, and has it changed the financials and the economics of the children's picture book, because it's also very expensive to produce them? The world has changed what, what we used to see. I started my career in publishing 20 years ago, and uh, the technology was not supporting that point of time. We, we had to, I mean, very rarely we used to get a board book, let's say a board book and a, a, a picture book with, with a lot of illustrations in it. I remember growing up, I used to have these Russian books, which were four color, otherwise everything was single color at that point of time in India. Uh, I think what has happened with economies of scale and the amount of production China has done in the last three decades, it has made the production of these complicated books easy. And, and now in the last five to six years, India has uh, India is coming up really well, brilliantly. I mean, there's nothing I can think of which can't be done in India. And, and it has really helped us to uh, to bring in these wonderful books which can really entice the children to pick it up and take it, put it in their bag. But the another aspect uh, and the commercial aspect uh, of this is that these picture books in last seven to eight years are more accessible to a lot of parents for various reasons. One is of course Amazon being Amazon and it serves uh, the X amount of paid codes which nobody does. 
But then uh, as the economy is growing up and young parents, if they have disposable income, they have this thought in the back of their mind that they can buy books for their children. I mean, this is something which you may, you may call it a fashion at the moment, that you give these books as a gift on the birthdays, and at the time, and as a return gift, these books are going, these early learning mass market books and picture books and sticker books. But then there is a sort of cultural shift which is happening from the academic curriculum market which we work, that if you have to read a book, you go and read your curriculum book, and apart from that, you can go out and play. So now that that, that change is happening, and also in India, a very price sensitive market, so our multiples and production of books is not as high as US and other places. So uh, compared to the rest of the world, when, when parents who have those exposure come and see the books are really cheap in India and quite accessible. So you are in the unique position of being the largest uh, uh, publisher, distributor, even retailer of books. You are in direct contact with thousands of schools and even influencers like parents and you know school principals who are like like primarily taking the buying decision for you know the their children or the library. So, what kind of trends have you seen uh, in 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 this children's picture book market? Because because as far as I know, it's very need and need based and educative uh, driven market. Correct me if I'm wrong. And if uh, there is interest in creative picture books for children, it's primarily. Uh, uh, met by international writers, like... Can I just put in just a second to make a point? There's a difference between picture books and illustrated picture books. So these are two separate markets. So if India is not an illustrated picture book market yet, we're still struggling to sell illustrated picture books. But the picture book market, in general, is a big, huge market. So I'll start with which Prashant ended, and I'll say that you made a distinction. So picture book, illustrated picture book, and activity book, uh, two, children activity book are two different domains completely. As we know, not, and not just in India, but specific to the Asian domain, we are very much interested in child's learning, but more of academic. So you will find a big market for the activity book side of it, but it's still in the market that is evolving when it comes to children illustrated books, right? Which is the picture books. The, the typical picture book that we talk about. And as, as you rightly mentioned, because of our exposure of being in touch with our consumers, uh, what we've observed is, and, and this was something that you know, when I joined school actually, and when I started looking at things, I saw picture books were very well appreciated but not bought. And the reason was, and, and, and you know, it's funny, but, but the reason given was for eight lines of text, it's too expensive. For it's not value for money, right? That's where my journey with picture books started, and and a, and a friend from the industry once coined one thing, and it, it stays with me. And I put her name. Her name is Atya Zeli. She works for an educational publishing company. She says if people say that you know for eight lines of text it's far too expensive, tell them to buy a newspaper for their child. That's where you get maximum text for the minimum price. Your child will learn anything over the know. Right? But but having said that, what is, and, and from my perspective, the way I look at children's books, uh, the market is evolving, still has not reached the point where it makes practical sense or commercial sense to produce picture books, but we continue to do that because that's where the start of the journey happens. But what what's encouraging to see is that it's improving. Second thing is that you know, if you ask me for value for money, it's the most valuable books in comparison to the money you spend. Because look at the stages your child goes through when a picture book is bought. First time when you read aloud to your child and the child is just listening to the story. Then the second stage is when the child makes sense of the story through the pictures while you are reading aloud to them. Third stage is when they can join the alphabet and make words and understand what you're saying, and fourth, when they can read to themselves. Those are the four stages it goes through, goes through, and last but not the least, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'll take 30 seconds more. Last but not the least, I think one disservice that we do to picture books is being branded as picture books are meant for kids. 
picture books are meant for all ages. I love all the picture books that come across me. There are always picture books on my table because I love them. And I realized that it was not that I was born with this, this whole idea that it's meant for all ages. I attended one session where you know we were doing this management development session and they were using a book called How Full Is Your Bucket? It's a chapter book, around 120 pages, which they use over two days to construct a management development session for senior executives of our company. And that went off very well. I was super impressed by that book. And then I came across a book called How Full Is Your Bucket for Kids, which was a picture book format. And let me tell you, in 15 minutes, you can get the gist of the two-day session if you want to as an adult by using just that picture. How? That's so I just wanted to talk about the PAC since I'm in the business of graphic literacy, the power of an image. And you give that image to the person reading it, even if it's you know, the beginner reader. Well, they have a brain, and they have a spot for critical thinking. They are expanding the story. They even are collaborating with the author who put that book together. They're putting in their ideas, their values. So reading just pictures is powerful. It is powerful. And that is where, you know, reading between the, the gray lines. You know, they once they get vocabulary, they can go on and they can tell you that story longer than the, you know, the text that's in that that page. So picture books are wonderful. So how has the Archie's uh, comic brand evolved over the years in terms of its themes and characters to, you know, move with the times? I mean, uh, you know, like balancing the commercial considerations and mass appeal with the uh, issues of diversity and inclusivity must have been a uh, sort of a tightrope walk. Well, Archie Cox has always had a formula, just like baking a cake. So our writers in 1941, they you know were you know in the office and the two heads said, "This is what we want." Put a bunch of teenagers in a school. You can all relate to that. You're all teenagers. You all went to school. Throw in a little bit of chaos and let the teenagers figure it out without any adult intervention. Think about those Archie stories that you have read. Always a little bit of chaos, and the teens would figure it out. The way we have stayed relevant is that those writers and pencilers had to bring in what was happening in the decade. And that's how Archie Comics has kept the beat for 80 years. Today, we hear the word diversity, 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 and of course, we are diverse today. If you look back at our pages in 1941, you see a big difference now. But our artists, artists and writers reflect what is happening. We are as current as the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, so you find that in our stories. And if anyone watched Riverdale, that was very different. I almost you know, grabbed my pearls and fainted, but once I you know, uh, got the storyline, it was still following that same formula, but taking in the darkness of what goes on today. So did that answer? Yeah, good. Okay. So I wanted to talk about uh, you know, e-book versions, digital versions of picture books. I know that Archie's has a, a digital edition also. Uh, does it lend itself well to uh, this format, the digital format, picture books? Comics perhaps uh, might lend itself better, but what about picture books? It does. I mean, technically it does. It is quite, quite possible, but without any interactive element, you are basically putting a PDF online. So, and if you go on, uh, con uh, go on convert that, book into an interactive book, then there's a lot of money which is involved. So a lot of publishers shy away from doing that. And apart from the illustrated picture book, there's nothing you can translate into an e-format because everything is activity-based. It's very difficult to do it. I mean, there are apps for it and you don't need books. The whole idea, I believe, is the age of age. And, and this is my own personal thing. It is the age of age, the parents and the school, and everybody is a little shy of providing a lot of digital exposure to the kids. So I mean, especially in our part of the world, uh, it, it is so, and also uh, our part of the world is also not way ahead in terms of broadband devices, not everybody have it. So there's not a huge market 
But if you ask me if there is a market and it translates well, well, there is technology, it can be translated well. Can it be used? It can be used. But is it getting used globally? I would say no. I mean, not that much, but if, I mean, what I know of. So to add to what Prashant said, I am, first of all, I, I would say that you know, for us, it's scholastic we need not one thing. What is important is the time it reads. How they consume the content or what content they consume is secondary. Because the moment, the moment you make the second part of it primary, you actually take them away from it. So that's the reason why, why what Scholastic does is we will, we will have it available in all formats so that any learner who wants to engage with it, any reader who wants to engage with that content is able to. Especially when we talk about picture books, you know, all parents cannot be an effective storyteller. So that's where the digital aid actually comes in handy. I'm very strong believer that you need to have a physical book to engage your young learner, but the digital aids could actually experientially take it to a different level. Because if I'm not a good storyteller, right, myself, and I just read the story in a plain format, on that day there was this thing that happened. It won't attract the child. But and there, if the digital aid comes to my rescue, and I'm able to make an experience out of it, alongside having a physical copy of it, and why I always harp about the physical copy of it is because, and especially in picture books, is because there's layering. There's a story that goes on in word format, but there is a parallel story that goes off in, in illustration format. And there's so much of learning that's layered into that picture book, in terms of what is the bird doing, where is the bird flowing to? What direction is it taking? How many birds are there? That might not be the part of the story. But that's the element that you build up. And that's why it's important. But as I said, let them be. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to bring up Art and Comics. We, of course, are available digital, Amazon, all, all sorts of ways for however that person wants to get their reading. But I always bring this up that people do not think about. The art of collecting. Collecting comic books is huge. So I do not think, you know, uh, print, the print comic book will ever go by the wayside because of digital, because the art of collecting is, you know, a wonderful hobby and it's powerful and it teaches so many life skills, organization and, um, you know, value of money and money increasing, you know, taking care of your comic book. I want to add one point to it. Uh, I think that's a very important point, not just for the children book or the, or the comic books that we're talking about. It's just about, in general, the books. You know, we all want to have a library. We all want to reread those books, pick up those books, and you know, maybe read a part of it and things like that. That only comes with a print book format uh, that you can keep it on a, on a bookshelf like this and, and pull it out when, whenever you want. And from the global trends that we see, the consumption, especially in the children's space, has gone down for the digital content, and the print book is again coming back. As I said, they are both going to coexist. Did it go up during the pandemic when uh, nobody no, no, had access to? There was no, no other choice. There was no other choice. There was no other choice. Uh, I want. I have a question for all three of you. I want you to like tell me about or tell the audience about the making of. Of, of a children's picture book, comics, what goes into identifying, nurturing, developing, retaining, writing talent for children's picture books, comics, and also illustrators? Oh. Well, I could start with that because I'm very proud when, you know, I wasn't a publisher, I was the art teacher in Paramus, New Jersey. Um, I was very keen on becoming very relevant, who our students are in school, and I wanted to reflect the autistic population. So I wanted an autistic character, but I wanted my writer, who was ever going to develop that character, to um, be very familiar or close to autism. So I did have a writer who had a daughter who was autistic, so that helped. And then I had to find a penciler and a colorist, and my colorist was from India. I have to remember and ask him how I met him. And that was a little difficult because, you know, um, my um, new character, there had to be diversity. Her mother's from the Philippines, her father's from Ireland. So trying to get that color right 
and just doing email, it was a little, um, little hard. But it, it takes a lot of steps, a lot of collaboration, a lot of teamwork. I always say nothing great can be done by, by one person. So if there's anyone in the audit, audience that wants to write a book, create a character, you know, you need a lot of teamwork. Don't think you have to do it all. But, and, and for me to create Scarlet took a few years. For us to push out an Archie comic story could take us three months, so. In our case, uh, you know, one thing which is very sure is that your picture books are a partnership between the author and the illustrator. And, and that partnership becomes effective and mostly if you will see, if you pick up any famous picture book uh, author, it's a combination of the author and the illustrator. So if Julia Donaldson is famous, all her books are illustrated by ethics. And, and that's why there's a very, very effective partnership and and the reason for that partnership is that you know it's somebody who can bring out the the few lines of text to life from the perspective of the author is very very important in here and and more so in rich books. Second thing is you know one thing that we try to do at Scholastic is when we are looking at picture books, it has to be a subtle message rather than a direct message. So if you try try to kind of put the learning objectives right in front of it and take the sense of the story out of it, children would not enjoy it because picture books are for sure the books that the child would read, reread and reread and when it's being used as read aloud, it will be read once, it will be read twice, it will be read thrice and the child is given the power to pick up the book that the parent, that he or she wants the parent to read aloud. Illustrated with an example from my own side, my daughter because I have I was blessed because my, both my kids were born while I was working with Scholastic. So I had all the research available. It was for me to apply it on them, right? So I used to read love to her every night since the time she was nine months. I was told I was 18 months too late, but better late than never. And there was one book that she used to pick up over and over again, and it was called We Made Breakfast for Mommy. It was a Rebus reader, and I would have read it, read it out to her at least a <coughs> and that's why if you do not have a direct message, you don't try to tell them, this book is about honesty, this book is about uh, collaboration, this book is about this, this book is about that. No. The story has to be built up in such a way that the message comes out very subtly. The enjoyment is there in the reading and in the illustrations. Prashant, you're, you're we, we, yeah, we have a, a different take on how we start uh, and, and Use these books. So we are we we find in uh, you know like nurture talent. You know because I'm sure like most publishers of children's books, you must be working with a large pool of freelancers. We are working with a large pool of freelancers, and now with a large pool of authors, we have pivoted towards making a lot of illustrated picture books. And this this year we have started, and over the period of the next one and a half years, we get talking about 60, 70 picture books from across the globe. So not, authors not only from India or illustrators not only from India, but from across the globe. Uh, but I, I think the, the approach is pretty different from any other. And, uh, why? Because uh, we, we are very, very much data determined company, right? So we figure out the trends which are happening and what our children are looking at, especially the parents, young parents, what they are looking at, what they are searching in terms of keywords for their children. And we, we find that first and we weave the story around that. And then we find the best talent from any place across the globe. And, and the reason is, I think probably we, we would be only one of the companies in India who reach out to 37, 30 different markets globally. And so we have to ensure that the regional sensitivity is there and it can cross over the boundaries. And, and a lot of other considerations we have to keep in mind. So we, we do not shy away to find the talent anywhere across the globe. And then we create this, these books, again, we, I have to get, my son is nine years old and he has been my guinea pig since ages when he was born. So, uh, one thing which I have learned, uh, there has to be something quirky and funny in a children's picture book. If it's not, the child will not have any interest. There should, should be some message, that's fine. But then it has to be something funny and that, actually I found out when, when he was pretty young and I was reading the book with no pictures, we didn't work. And, he used to like cry out 
laughing and everything and I used to cry from laughing and then I realized that if you have to hold these children to have a book and they want to pick it again and again, there has to be some funny little quirky element which they like and they will also take that book to the school, they will tell to other children and that's how the sales of the book will happen. Can I add something to that? Yep. The only time you've seen a picture book go on to the New York Times bestseller list was a book that was done 20 years ago in New Zealand. Then the US market picked it up. It's called Wonky Donkey. Right? And as you see, it's every one line it says he haw And there was one librarian grandmother who picked up that book and was with her, I think, granddaughter who was probably seven, eight months. And she was reading aloud to her. Forget about the expressions of the child, but the expressions of the grandmother was so amazing. And she was just, she went on and that video went viral. And so did the sales touch the roof. So only time we've seen a picture book touching the top of the New York Times bestsellers was with this book. And the I, I think the credit goes to that grandmother, that Reddit, who did that video and put it up there. And the keyword was he more. So, Gorky Funny author actually. Question for the two of you, why don't uh, homegrown uh, children's picture books travel uh, as well to the rest of the world as you know, international children's books travel to India? Is it because of uh, uh, the, the cultural specificities or is it because of uh, the design aesthetic or the, uh, you know, yeah. I think it has nothing to do with the cultural and the design aspect. It's 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 something to do with the logistics. So let's let's talk about the Indian publishing market, especially children books. And uh, there there and uh, by the way, there's other side of business which people are not aware of. India is the largest exporter of children books across the globe. There are 20 to 25 big book packages in India. And I was telling this to someone this morning. There's a guy who does close to 250 crores just exporting books to RD, Carrefour, I mean, white labeling these books and sending it to them. So we have been exporting books from, I mean, since the time I have been into the business. Books. It's all uh, early learning mass market books. But let's come back to the children's picture book. The problem is that uh, nobody in the country has that distribution like uh, distribution set up like the international publishers are. So nobody in India is like a Indian pen random house or Indian Harper Collins. And this is what we are trying to break at the moment. This is what we are trying to do that at one point of time we can at this point of time we can launch books in five countries. So I think that is the barrier we want to break. It's only because there was no one available to do that, it's not traveling. There are wonderful picture books in India, which have been created and which are still getting created. There's a lot of market and there's no cultural sensi sensitivity. If it's a good book, it's a good book across the globe. It's just that it, it needs to find its way out there. And finding the way out there is difficult. I, I'd like to say that um, for Archie Comics, it has been cultural because kids were hearing around the globe how the students treat their principal how you can bring in tons of food into the classroom, how you could get away with cutting class. So people were very curious about American life. They really thought this is what goes on in American schools, but it doesn't. But kids really thought they were getting an insight to America, and it was all fantasy. But people somehow bought into it. But ours traveled around because the art of conversation around the globe. So for us, it was a, a, a cultural, people in being inquisitive. I wanted to talk about your legendary association with Omar Oda of Variety Bookstores. He's been distributing Archie's in India for many decades. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, he has uh, taken upon the task of translating Archie's into uh, in, in, in the Hindi. Yeah. So, uh, and that happened on how, live watch, I think. And how, how, when, when did that happen? How did the, uh, how were the books received? And are there any plans to translate it to other Indian languages? Well, when um, I had married into the, you know, the Archie comic kingdom, my husband told me he has a friend, a business friend in India, Omarora. And Omarora 
is coming to New York and he's taking us out. So only come once a year, maybe sometimes twice a year, and take us all out to dinner. And he, we always wanted to go for Indian food. He, he wanted to go for spaghetti and whatever, but he was very sweet and kind and always would take us to a good Indian restaurant. So I got to know Om Aurora and for, you know, when my husband was alive and always wanted us to come to India. But my husband had a huge fear of flying. You know, if I said, could we go to an island, he would say Long Island. That was a car ride in New, in, in, in New York. So we never went places. So, um, you know, sadly when my husband passed away and I stepped out of the classroom and into the Archie boardroom, it was not planned, I was very curious about the Indian um, people and their attraction. I didn't know what their attraction was until I spoke to them and, and heard all these wild stories. One girl told me in Pune that she wanted to learn about America and she was so thrilled she learned about the hamburger because that is where she is going to go when she goes to New York, to a hamburger place. And she said when the person bought the burger, she, she thought they made a mistake because she said the burger was just this one little burger. She thought burgers were like that, with Junkhead eats. So she was shocked, but she said she learned you only can eat one burger. So Om um, became you know, such a dear um, person to not only our family, but helping me be a woman in business and coming to India for 15 years, and I'm seeing him tomorrow. I have an office in New Delhi. It's Om Aurora's um, office, Conduit Place, am I saying it right? So he's a big, long table, and I said, oh, that's my office, that's C. And he goes, yes, that will we'll put a sign up. But it's really not my office, but I consider it because of Om's warmth and his, his friendship. So I've just known Om since, you know, Michael and then my desire to learn about the Indian people and Om bringing me over and being at my side. And how have the books studied, uh, the comics studied in Hindi? Um, I have always been told, I don't know recently what's going on because the movie, The, the Archies, is fabulous. I've seen it six times. I'm learning some of the words and Om has the CD for me, the music soundtrack. I always like CD, so that's going to be playing in my home in Long Island, um, uh, you know, all summer long when I'm here. Beautiful music. So um, I'm going to ask him, but I was was told that the translation just didn't get those punchlines since it was in Hindi. That's what he had told me years ago when we were discussing it. But it may change because the film was fabulous, and um, I'm very impressed with what. The producer and the actors gave us, and I want to go to Uti now. That movie is going, once people see it globally, is probably going to increase tourism because it's beautiful. And even, you know, Uti I didn't know about, and um, it, it has pushed me now to want to come and visit that. I want to talk to the two of you about uh, the state of uh, children's picture books in the Indian vernacular languages. Is Scholastic or Wonder House they translating their catalog or their bestsellers or their select books into Indian languages? And because uh, the demand for such books is low in these markets, how do the financials work out? Um, so I'll be honest, we've not done much translations around these books. But, but what we've done is that you know, we've, we've done translations of picture books wherever we've had. Uh, connects with the government or agencies like Runturi, where uh, we know the quantities are there. And we've so far done translations into 12 different languages of India. Uh, books ranging from about 10 in a particular language to going up to about 40 plus. Uh, to the extent that you know the first children book available in the uh, local language of Ladakh was a scholastic book. We did 10, uh, we did 11, and performed did 10 for that project. And a uh, total of 21 books were there, used for all the school libraries of uh, Ladakh. So we've gone into translation, but not in a big way. What I see is with the NAB coming in and talking so much about the, about the mother tongue, probably the language market is going to go bigger. Time to tell 
We, we have a robust uh, publishing program in Hindi. I mean, we do a lot of picture books, especially the mythology in Hindi. Uh, we have close to 60, 70 titles in Hindi. Originally in Hindi or translating it from? Uh, it's, it's mostly translating from, uh, from English. And uh, we have, not on the illustrated picture book side, but we have uh, done books in Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, Malayalam, Bengali, recently Bengali. So, uh, but again, I mean, the, the program is not that huge. Our, our primary market is the English speaking market in India. And one of the reasons we keep it that way because that also gives us a larger market outside. Um, I, I'm here as I travel, there's a big issue among many countries about fluent English. So, you know, getting your um, learning English is wonderful when you have pictures because that is a support for the reader who's struggling, you know, to figure out how to speak English. So that plays a part into it, but there's, you know, a big talk and revival of the importance of the cultural um, language. So I think you're correct that you'll be seeing a rise in that. But I do hear um, fluent English among our young people is, is a problem. Um, I think pandemic uh, had a very adverse impact on this segment of books because of the rising paper costs and um, many other like, logistic, logistical issues. So. I just wanted to know, has this market recovered from the pandemic and the, the war that followed? I would add here that the market has recovered, not just recovered. I think it's currently, if I look at it, it's much better than the pre-pandemic times. And, and that's the encouraging signs that I see at this point of time. For this segment? For, for all the segments, including this segment. I think we never had the problem with the pandemic. If it was not pandemic, we would have not grown. So we have a different story altogether. So uh, uh, the genesis of a business, the publishing imprints, I run, I, the genesis of the business is distribution. We are the largest trade distributor in the country. And we were only impacted for the first 35 days. And beyond that, I think one of the things that gave us advantage if it was not pandemic, uh, we we work very well with Amazon and our books were available with Amazon. So as soon as the, the heavy restrictions of the first 35, 45 days got over, we geared up and we ensured that all of our books are going to Amazon. And uh, there was a machinery that was working behind this. Behind this. Uh, we had printers lined up during the pandemic who were printing continuously. And at certain point of time, I remember during the pandemic, of the top 100 books on Amazon.in, that uh, uh, 50 books were our imprints. So uh, that gave us an impetus to grow. And during the pandemic only, we were focusing on different markets. Uh, right now, 50% of our revenues are, uh, are coming from US. Uh, and we're pretty big in US now. Uh, in terms of the amount of revenues, we do not the, the amount of books we sell. But we would have not started US if it was not pandemic, because we were sitting at home thinking about markets to grow. And that gave us sort of something to dabble with and luckily we got successful there and now we have a proper distribution. I was telling someone yesterday we got an order from the Walmart and Barnes and Noble. So, I mean, that is something happening sitting here, so it's truly amazing. That's because of your international distribution deal. The inter international distribution. And, and there was nothing else to do but read. And so when the packages came, we sprayed them and we brought in those wonderful exactly. um, books. So there was a, a short period, but then all of a sudden it was you know, our activity to read. The, the, the maximum amount of, I think, uh, the books we sold were activity books. Because children were sitting at home and parents wanted them to do something, not to be glued at screen all the time. So a lot of sticker books, activity books, coloring books, they were sold in huge numbers. Because they want children to be engaged with something. They needed a break. They needed a break, yeah. So how do you deal with the issue of, uh, you know, several publishers publishing the same kind of books, you know, like you are one of the pioneers in the activity book space, and without naming names, several publishers have started, you know, like publishing similar books and quite uh, uh, shamelessly copying, you know, like design elements. So how, how does it work in terms of the legalities, the copyright, and also 
is it not counterproductive to uh, have the same kind of book being published by four or five publishers? How does this work? I just want to understand this. It, it hurts, first of all, because I mean, you, you copy the concept, that is fine. I mean, I, I can understand ABCD numbers, colors, and shape. You cannot have a 27th alphabet or something, so you'll have 26th alphabet. But the problem is when you when you take the design, the complete design as it is, and you create a different book. But then we can't do much about it. There's no legality around it. We have explored the options, but then you cannot copyright that certain element. You cannot copyright numbers, color shapes, and all that. Uh, it's a it's a tough fight. Uh, I think that uh, one of the things which uh, uh, we focus upon is uh, the the quality of production and and the quality of content and the price point. So our price point is maybe five percent higher than anybody else, but then we provide them with the quality content. One one more thing which we are very careful upon because we provide these children to way, uh, we provide these books to very young children. So we always test our product. We test the ink, we, we do the inflammability test, we, we do the ink testing, we make sure that by by all means a child is never going And you also, also mentioned the size of the letters and the illustrations and how that so it's very scientific. Quite right? different from uh, the, the it's, it's very scientific. The, uh, the most difficult thing uh, uh, is to make books for children. People think it's easy to slam A and B on a book. We have to be very careful about the size, the font. Uh, when we we work on a story book, we try to find uh, a font which is dyslexic friendly. So we have done that, and it's it's really appreciated. We always try to make sure that if you are giving a book to a three uh, year old, there are not much distraction on the book. So. A lot of people say, what you have done on a white background, you have put A in black and that is your book. Yes, that is our book because we have done it intentionally. We don't want the attention to go anywhere else. I think we have time for one or two questions. One question. Two, please. Yeah. Hi. My question is actually for you, Kanish. Are there, uh, do you see a trend of writers uh, coming to you or to other um, who are writing more and more children's books and picture books and things? Uh, how does that whole, whole Yeah, they, work? They, they do come to me for with, with these proposals and some of them know that you know at some point they'd have to bring in a illustrator because many of them are just writing the text. They know how the illustration should look like. So I mean, there is a lot of awareness, but I'm sorry to say very few publishers are open to picture books because of uh, you know, rising costs and because publishers haven't had much success with the sales of picture books. And I'm talking about creative picture books. I'm not talking about activity books. So I'm open to doing them, but uh, you know, I'm just like an agent who's selling books to a publisher. So it's, it's a lot so, so I just had two lines to it. I know we are running waste time. Uh, one kind of will always reach out to us. Second, uh, in the last two years, what I have seen is that you know a lot of uh, new authors, especially the mothers, would spend time with their own children, understood the nuances of it, coming up with some really good content. And and I can tell you that you know we've published some five or six new authors in the picture book category in the last twelve months. One more question. Yeah, open for submissions. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the insightful session. Uh, unfortunately, this is going to be probably a little long because I'm an illustrator myself. I was an animator some time back. I just quit my job to create graphic novels, children's books. So I think from in all that you've discussed, there are a few. I'm a little confused because here we're talking about comics. Here we're talking about children's activity books, which is very, very like preschooler level. This is not preschooler, Archie is not preschooler, so it is more like comics and more. And none of you actually talked about the cognitive improvement that you know sequential storytelling brings in, in a small child. You know, it first they learn the alphabet, they start relating to the picture, and understand what's going on on every frame, and then they start seeing the story, which which is where the arc comes in, and then they see cause and effect over a longer, more complex storyline. So I, I, I felt a little confused there because you were talking about very different things. That is one. Second thing is I want to know if you are talking about comic books and the distinction between comic books and picture books, where is it that the comic book starts 
not be in picture books anymore because we have had many, many, many comics as I was growing up. I had Diamond Comics, Raj Comics, Manoj Comics, you name it. I had action, adventure. I had things copied from Hollywood, which have been, you know, bad copies of Batman. And then all that literally vanished. You know, as between when I grew from 15 to 22, I suddenly looked back and there's no Manoj comics, there's no Raj comics. Still there. They're still, still there. there, I know. But the way it was there. And then suddenly now we have DC, Marvel, you know, if I go to a bookstore today, I will not find a Raj comics. I will not. If I go to a, a Bareilly or a Dhanbal, I may still find these. Indrajal comics, I, I, they have disappeared. So my question is, what what is the progression really here? You know, where were we? Where would we go from here? Um, well, well, I just will quickly say, I think the umbrella for our panel was about the image and finding what will hook a person into turning those pages. And to let you know, Archie Comics does have um, a hardcover book for that beginner reader. And we, we purposely wanted them to be part of the generational Archie conversation because you will see the grandmother passing it down to her daughter and then that daughter passing it down to their child. But I think the umbrella was about the, the image of that, how it attracts a person to turn the page. Yeah, I think we most mostly covered the business aspect of things rather than the cognitive and the process, the creative process. I would love to do that, but I I think we would run short of time so right in a moment. Because we are running short of time, we can take this offline. But yeah, I, I, think would, I, would, offline. I would like to find out. Thank you so much for this wonderful panel and thank you to the audience for Thank you so much. We can continue our conversation outside. Thank you.